Thank you for telling me because usually I have set it up to record automatically, but it didn't start. And that's kind of interesting. Okay, thank you. I don't think we missed very much. So in, the, um, in this one, what I wanted to say is that you said K and this um, has all of the values of the um, S1 to S21, uh, but magnitude. And then delta is this parameter and we use for delta also its magnitude. So we have either the first two or recently there is a new parameter. And if there, you look at recent publications for amplifier design is this new parameter. And why do you think the new parameter is better than the K and delta? What do you observe in the K and delta parameters that um, make you think that new will be better? That in the K parameter, if S12 is zero, all right, which um, makes it a unilateral, you remember when we talked about unilateral, that S12 is zero is called unilateral. That's when we spoke about when we introduced the gains. So if S S12 is zero, of course, goes to infinity, but at the same time, um, it's, it's, it's a problem in this one. And so people always go to this new equals this relationship where S12 going to zero does not create a, a problem with this specific um, parameter, but actually it gives a value that um, it involves also additional restrictions on S11 and S22. And then what that really means is that by S12 going to zero, it really um, masks the rest. So um, if S12 is not zero, then S11 and S22 play a key role in this one. And eventually, you know, um, a value above one is meaningful. But when S12 goes to zero, it overwhelms the, the rest and you don't get any valuable information. So people go to M where even if S12 goes to zero, which happens in many, many transistors may not necessarily become equal to zero, but it can become very, very, very small. And the new parameter then is much more meaningful in uh, defining the unconditional stability. So from this point on, I would like you to use the new parameter and not the K and delta, all right? Because we will see many transistors where S12 goes to zero practically. So the, the value of K is meaningless. It does not show you very much, okay? Now, in conditional stability, what happens when K or mu become less than one? Does that mean that this transistor will never operate like an amplifier? Because what happens when it goes away from stability? As we said, it's similar to getting a positive feedback, as you remember from the circuits um, classes that you took before. And then it enhances the input constantly to the amplifier. So it drives the output of the amplifier very high up and eventually burns it, burns the amplifier out, all right, if it goes there. Or it keeps oscillating in the circuits. If there are circuits to stop the amplifier from getting damaged, then practically you will see oscillations. So um, is there anything else even other than being um, unconditionally stable or oscillating? And the answer is yes. So as a matter of fact, there are many, many cases of amplifiers where they are not unconditionally stable. They have K or mu, and we said mu now, less than one. However, this amplifier can be designed to uh, operate as an amplifier by selecting the appropriate gamma, e, the appropriate gamma S and gamma L. 
So practically what it means is that if we have an amplifier which is unconditionally uh, stable, then we have a choice of uh, matching networks, input and output matching networks to make this amplifier stable and to make it work well. Okay, so now we are gonna talk about conditional stability and then we are gonna see how we are gonna find the stability regions for an amplifier. Any questions before I continue? Yeah, I have one about the uh, mu equation. Mm -hmm. Can you scroll to that? Um, for that uh, condition right there, does delta still have to be, at the magnitude of delta, does this still have to be less than one? Or no, you're only yeah. looking at mu. All right, so in the first two, both of them have to satisfy, you, while you use the same delta expression, it does not have to be less than one. Great, okay, I just wanted to make sure, thank you. Yeah, okay. Any other questions? Okay, so now let's go back to a very familiar um, network arrangement that we have at the center of it. We have, it's the, the whole thing makes the LNA, obviously. At the center of it here, we have the transistor, this one. And this transistor is gonna be given with the scattering parameters. And you will see that scattering parameters are given in all different ways and forms. So um, uh, some scattering parameters will be given on tables as we've seen already in the past. Some scattering parameters will be given as some of them on the Smith chart. And we are gonna talk about this later because you also have it in your homework. And then some of them are gonna be give them in, given in magnitude because what happens is when they measure, when you take a transistor, you bias it, and then you measure it, what you really are measuring is like either magnitude of the scattering parameters, or you see them on a the Smith chart in the measurement equipment. Um, now, if you have embedded software, that takes these values and makes them, you know, magnitude and phase. So then, because you can do that, you can go into a measurement equipment, um, uh, like a network analyzer, and then where you make measurements of your circuits, you have now biased your transistor and everything. And then you try to measure the scattering parameters. Um, you can enter your own software or you can use available software to translate your scattering. But if you just look at the output and you don't have the software, you're gonna find scattering parameters on the Smith chart because that's what they have most of them or amplitude. And sometimes maybe phase, but not necessarily. So uh, we are gonna practice that because sometimes when you look at the literature, uh, you may not necessarily see the scattering parameters provided to you in great extent that we, we saw from these um, tables that we got from the manufacturer. And so I think uh, you should be able to recognize how to calculate them in case you need to do that. But in any case, until we get there, let us now see how we are gonna define what we call the stability circles. So what happens is the following. A for a transistor, to be stable, we need to make sure that gamma in magnitude is less than one, all right, obviously, and gamma out magnitude is less than one. That implies that our gamma L and gamma S will be of course less than one, and they will be less than one for us. Now we have developed matching networks and we have um, loads and sources that are passive. So we expect gamma L and gamma S to be less than one. However, we need to find an operating region for the transistor where now gamma in and gamma out are less than one. Because if we do have this set that we can confirm that they are less than one, but these two are either one of them is larger than one, then practically um, we cannot, um, 
make an, an amplifier, a power amplifier out of this. So you need to find the region where, if there is one, you need to find the region where these are less than one. If you cannot find a region where these are less than one, as you will see below, then, then of obviously this transistor needs to be either biased differently, something needs to happen to be able to be used as an amplifier. Okay, so these two equations that I have here, these two, um, in fact, these two, um, develop what we call or define what we call the input stability circles and the output stability circles. Okay, and now um, without the proof, which is in the book and is very extensive, and I don't necessarily want you to remember how to prove that, I want you to remember that this equation here that specifies the magnitude of gamma in really has all of the, for any a gamma in that satisfies this equation. The gamma in is inside or outside this particular circle. Remember this, that the gamma in is inside or outside, and then you have to test to find out whether it is inside or outside of the circle, all right? And then you will see that below. But so we know for now that this equation here tells you that gamma in is either inside or outside this type of circle, where this one here is the center and the center is a complex number. So it has a magnitude and it has a phase. And there, of course, you're gonna find it from the Smith chart. And second, um, has a radius. And the radius, of course, is like positive number, right? It is not a complex number. Now, how are you gonna find these numbers and use them in conjunction with the Smith chart? First of all, you will have to find out whether gamma in less magnitude, less than one, is inside or outside the circle. This is the circle. This is the stability circle for, say, in this particular case, Let me see. Here I have output for output and it should be out, excuse me. Input stability circle, I said. So input stability circles or output. Ah, okay. So um, I need to change some and I may have made in output. It should be, you know, I tried to copy and I have made some changes. So I'm, I'm gonna make some because some things are not. So um, in the output, we have gamma L and, and that should be, just a second. I apologize for going back and forth, but I have made some mistakes. Okay, so from here we go, conditional stability. Okay, gamma out has gamma S and gamma in has gamma L. No, it should be the other way around. I apologize. So this should be gamma. Um, no, that's correct. I'm sorry. Why did I get confused? Gamma in is when it looks and has gamma L and gamma out has gamma S. Okay, so far so good. I apologize. Got confused for a moment. Okay, so um, we are now in gamma in, we develop the circle CS, CL, RL. And this circle is called CL, RL, because primarily, as you can see, depends on gamma L, all right? So gamma in is what you see as you look to the right of the, to the right, as you can see here, you're looking gamma in, you're looking to the right. And of course your load is present when you look there this way. And gamma out, let me erase this. And gamma out now is like this. So, gamma, so 
um, your source is present, all right? The load from the source in, is present in this expression. So that's why you get in the gamma in, you get gamma L present in the gamma out, you get gamma S. All right, so uh, input stability circles, we have gamma in, gamma L, and we call the circle CL and RL because practically they show um, where your in, in what place your gamma in should be. So um, your circle, your uh, transistor is stable. So if your S11 here in the Smith chart is less than one in magnitude, so um, then this range, uh, is where the transistor is stable. And if your S11 here is larger than one, then this is the range where your gamma in is less than one. So practically um, by drawing these two circles, all right, and if they, in, in the case where S11 is less than one, then you have a whole range of possible gamma in values um, that they're going to provide you with a stability condition for your amplifier. If you go to this case on the right and um, your S11 is like, larger than one in the Smith chart, there is only a small slice, the intersection between the two circles. And that means that if the two circles do not intersect, then practically you cannot find a gamma in which is less than one and can be materialized. So practically that means that you have to go back into your transistor design and change that design to be able to provide um, to a circle, C, L, R, L, that intersects with the uh, uh, Smith chart. I will go to the, um, excuse me. I will go to the output and that's where I have to make the changes. So the output here, and as I said, I tried to copy one and I forgot to change the same, the change. The, the words here. So that should be output. This then should be out. And this should be, let me make sure, According to this one, yeah, should be S to two should be an exchange of, of num of values should be um, I will correct those S to two and then here should be S one one and then here. You would find that my notes would have been incorrect otherwise. Um, by looking at the book. So that make sure that um, you always check the book as well. Okay, and then also, but it's exactly the same, but the same kind of thought that um, the gamma out has to be inside or outside the circles. And then these ones here now, you find them. Um, and let me see the other ones. I had for CL. Now I have corrected those. So these are correct. The ones that I have here from that point on, we have the correct um, values. Okay, so now again, for the looking at the being on the right side of the um, transistor and looking to the left, we see everything that is coming from the source. And now we're developing two circles, CS and RS. And 
again, you take now S to two to see to be less than one to make sure that you're stable in this region where your gamma magnitude of gamma out is less than one. And then if your S to two is larger than one, that is this intersection. And if your S to two is larger than one and there is no intersection, then you have to do exactly what you've done before. All right. So practically what that tells you is the following. It tells you, um, and I'm gonna go back to this, both pictures, they tell you the following. I'm in the input. You see that the input is the pink area on my Smith chart. But I'm looking at a circle that really represents the circle CLRL. And you wonder why we call it CLRL because that circle has information about the load, all right? But primarily is also an information about the transistor itself. So it is extremely important that this circle and the Smith chart intersect to be able to find a solution, all right, for this transistor, which are, is conditionable, conditionably con, uh, stable. And the same thing applies to the other circles, which we call output circles, but in reality, they get information about the source. And in addition, of course, primarily, they carry information about the transistor. So practically to be able to um, identify your stability region, you need to find the section where your S22 is less than one. If it's inside, as I said, the Smith chart, that's where your values could be. If it's larger than one in, in, this, in the Smith chart and then but is um, the two circles intersect. And then practically you have to um, find a value or you have to match it. So your gamma out is in this particular slice. Okay, now, question. yeah, questions, because I know that that may be a little confusing. Yeah, how did you find the point CS on this mixture? Okay, now, that's a good question. We go to the Smith chart and um, the Smith chart down here, I will use this Smith chart practically. You see that they, they also have um, the different, um, different scales here. Now, the scale of, I mean, let's look at the expressions for C, okay. So CL primarily, primarily has, it's a point. It has a magnitude and it has a phase. And um, you see it's a function of S22, S11, all of these reflection coefficients. So practically you're gonna use the same scale. All right, you, you look that, remember it. We're gonna go to the Smith chart, use the same scale on the Smith chart that is linear. You see that where it says reflection coefficient. That scale I would use, and uh, you uh, go out if, of course, it's above one. Of course, you're not gonna limit, there are specific Smith charts that are developed. Um, I mean, all the Smith charts, you can use it like that. So you are going to measure um, the distance between zero and one. And if you have 1.2, then you will extend it outside of the Smith chart by a proportional amount. Do you understand what that means? So you, you, it's like you scale your measurements to this, um, to this here ruler. You scale everything to this. This dimension here is one. And then you scale every number to this one. Does that make sense? So practically, I don't hear anything. So let me try. Let's assume that I wanna find the radio, the radius or the center, excuse me, the point, one point. Let's assume that CS or CL, whatever is one of the term, is 1.2 
and has um, a face of, um, what should I do, 30 or 130, for example. Okay, from here to here is one. Okay, if this is one, then 1 1.2, is like I extend, I extend this, I extend this, this, which is 0 0.2 to the to the right, to the left. So 1.2 is going to be somewhere here. Okay. So this is your 1.2, and then I will draw a line outside of the circle. Oops, that's not a very good line. I will draw this line. Okay, outside of the circle, I will see where it intersects. And then I will draw a circle that has this, this center and this radius. And then so the circle that I will draw is going to be this one somewhere. Let me see. Ah. Let me do a smaller one and I would, no, there. Okay, let me put this one to the center. And let me grow it on this side. Okay, if you do it correctly. So um, my value is somewhere here on this circle. All right, the distance from this point one is 1.2. Okay, now the phase. Uh, the phase for this, and then you're looking at um, the angle that starts from zero. Oh, no, exactly, where is the phase? Phase says here, angle of transmission uh, coefficient, angle of reflection coefficient. It is somewhere here. Um, now, for this and then the other is angle of reflection coefficient. Now, in this one, let's assume that is 130, all right? So 130, if it's um, zero here, 130 is here. So for this ar arbitrary number that I gave you, the point CL is here. Okay. And then um, you calculate the radius and then you just the same using the same scale, uh, zero to one, you develop this, the circle around it. So let's now, um, we will do some examples, but uh, then you find R sub L. Let's see, how do we find R sub L? R sub L is here. R sub L is obviously a, a, a number that is smaller than one, as you can see, all right? Um, it's smaller than one primarily because S1, 2, and S2, 1 are very small. And then you have a delta and then S2, 2, the second power, you, you have two small numbers, but it's a small number. As R sub L in most cases, I, I, you plug in your uh, scattering parameters, it's going to be a relatively small number like the circles you see here. It's not going to be something huge, in, a, in, in other words, for a real transistor. So in that case, if I go here and I find, for example, R sub L to be 0 0.5, then I will use the same scale as I did before, and I will draw this circle. something like that, all right? And in, for this particular case, I have, and it's arbitrary, as I said. So don't think that I got these numbers from something um, specific. It's not, it just I made them up to see how, and that's the area of intersection, okay? 
Any questions on how we do that? So obviously, um, you're not going to use this myth chart, which is so big. You're going to use something that has a lot of space outside when you look for the stability circles. As you see in the book, and as you will see in many other publications, which is practically here. So you're going to use these kinds of Smith charts. So that it gives you space to draw outside. Any questions about this? No, so you may ask. OK. I'm now still that... not clear. I'm still not clear, sorry, um, how to What's determine like the, like the radius and center of the circle. The center is determined. We have the magnitude. Okay, so this is, these are the two. Do you like to do two examples to see that? Okay. Yeah, okay, let's do it examples. Okay, because I had started one. Um, I have started um, an example here that I wanted to do with you. And um, what I would suggest that you do in this particular case is that um, in the beginning, I will try to, um, okay, let me erase. I had this example, I don't know whether we'll do exactly this one or I will change it for a moment. But um, in, um, let's try to, to solve what is in front of us, which is just to specify the circles. Okay, um, forget about this for now, or maybe let's use it. Okay, now this one, somebody has measured a transistor here and forget about designing for maximum gain. So we just get got this transistor. We wanna see, is it um, unconditionally stable or is it conditionally stable? And this transistor, they give the values to you like this, all right? They give you two points, and let's assume they measure it in some particular frequency. I will make it up also. Let's assume that the frequency for this one, F, F here, is one gigahertz. It's not important for us at this moment, but let's assume this one. Somebody measured it. They give you these parameters. So they don't give you a table. First of all, I wanted to tell you how to do that, how to deal with this issue. They give you this. Um, how do you calculate your scattering parameters? That's number one question, all right? And for this one, let's observe something. They say that S12 is zero. What does that mean? S12 is zero. It means that the transistor is what? is what? Unilateral. Do you remember this definition? If S12 is zero, the transistor is unilateral and it simplifies a number of expressions. Let's start with that one. Okay. First of all, what does it do? It makes delta, okay, so let's write down what is gonna do for us if, and I will write it here. So if, make it large so you can see it. If S12 is zero, then practically your delta is S11 times S22. And then second, your mu will be one minus S11 square divided by S22 minus S11 S22. And then you have S11 complex conjugate. All right. So that's what it is. And um, that is equal to what? What do you see from here? That this is equal to one minus S11 magnitude divided by what? S22, okay? 
And then you have one minus S11 squared. Do you see that? So practically, this one becomes one over S22. To two. That's your mu for a unilateral. What happens therefore, now let's look at the scattering parameters that they gave us. They gave us two scattering parameters. You see S22 to two is less than one. So immediately you understand your mu is larger than one. What does that mean for S22? To that is unconditionally stable, okay? So let us assume that your S22 to two was not that one, but your S22 to two was um, outside of the Smith chart, was larger than um, one. In that case, you would, and, and in fact, somebody would give you that your S22 to two is not exactly the problem that I had in mind to solve with you, but I can change it. And then I will solve that one later. So let's assume that your S22 to two was somewhere here. S22. To two. So, okay, that value and had the face would be a reflection coefficient. So the, the face from the reflection coefficient, angle of the reflection coefficient starts there. Wait, sorry, apologize for this thing. With the, the angle of the reflection coefficient starts here and then zero and goes negative. So the angle for this is going to be minus here which is minus 55, okay? So let's assume that your S22 from here is 1.4 minus 55. Okay, if you get that then, and you go to um, see what is going to happen to this one, then practically you have, um, the value of S to two, so your mu is less than one in that case, all right? So is obviously conditionally stable. And now we wanna find out where those circles are. So you have to plug in here, you have to of course find Delta, and then you have to find S11 complex conjugate, and then you will have to find this expression. Okay, now, um, this one is going to give you a CL in magnitude and phase. And let's assume that in this particular case, if we have time, I will do this. So your CL, S to two, I gave them, so you have to cal calculate um, the delta here. So you will have to calculate your delta. You, you have your S to two magnitude. You have your S11 magnitude, all right? And you, you find the magnitude of S11 from here. And then its phase, it's from here, okay? So the phase for S11 is gonna be minus 168 something. And that is minus 55. So then, um, from these two, you're gonna find your CL and Delta, you're gonna find your CL. Of course, S12 is zero, so that it does not exist. And then you're gonna find your RL. And then the way I showed you, you're gonna compute, you're going to calculate your CL and RL. But I think you said you don't know how to find the, the uh, the point CL, is that what you said? Did you say that? Yes or no? I cannot hear anybody. I'm a little bit confused. Yes. Tell me. About what? 
uh, about how is S22 could be outside the Smith chart? Because um, the transistor is, you know, you remember that the transistor produces energy. That's why we have a gain that is not, is higher than one. Do you remember that? So if the transistor did not produce energy, obviously we could not get more out of less. It's not like it produces power because you provide um, energy there through the DC. So your transistor practically here, your, your transistor gets DC power, all right, through the DC bias networks. You get a smaller F and you get a larger F. So it's not like that you violate, you know, the, third, the second law of thermodynamics, obviously. So your S to two can be higher than one. Any of your scattering parameters can be higher than one. It is a uh, way to think about it that uh, like there's negative reflection, meaning like there's more. Uh, yes, you can out. think of Yes, you can think about this like this, or you can think about this in the following way. So this is DC power. So you put energy in DC form, you're grounded. And then you, um, S22 is nothing else, but when you send a, a um, signal in, what you get out, isn't it? That's your S22, S22. Assuming that there is no input from here. All right, so when you write, in fact, is V, how do you write? V um, one minus V two minus is S one one, S um, one two, S one two, S two one, S two two. And that's V two plus, V one, excuse me, V one plus, V2 plus. Okay. What is S22? Um, V1 minus equals S1 or, uh, okay, V2 minus equals S21 V1 plus plus S22 V2 plus. Let's assume that your V1 plus is zero. All right. So practically your V2 minus equals S22 V2 plus, which implies exactly what I said. If there is no incoming from left, okay? If this from left is zero and it's only an incoming V2 plus from the right, the negative V2 minus is higher. Why is that? Because of this you may not have a, an RF coming, but there is a, a gain in this, the intrinsic gain of this amplifier is producing more output that is coming in because of the feedback that exists and the reflection here. There is a feedback mechanism and because of the reflection of that, you get more output here compared to the input that you put in. Does this make sense? Yes, thank you. Otherwise also, you know, if that was not the case, you, we would never, that would be a passive device, all right? It would not be active device. If we could not have that, if we never had this, then always your gain out would be less than your gain in. Because unless you put power in there, it is converted from DC to RF. And that's what a power amplifier does in RF frequencies, converts DC to RF. You will never be able to amplify anything. So that's why it's happening. Now it's 2.30. So here we're gonna do two things. I have until next, um, I put an exercise in place. Until next Wednesday, please, um, 
look at the exercise that I have already um, distributed. And um, next Wednesday, you mean uh, this coming November Wednesday? The... I mean, no, no, this no, 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 this Wednesday. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, and, yes, yes, until our next lecture. Um, do the exercise, and then I will, for our next lecture, I will have some examples that I will solve ahead of time and then put them on the web on a, a campus to see how to create, to put a particular CL and um, oh. a radius. And then uh, we are going to move forward with after these, after the stability circles with the gain uh, circles. We're not going to be able to see how to work with both of them unless at least we have introduced the gain circle so then we can start some designs, all right? Because it is true that in addition to stability, you want to consider some other things to be able to match because the stability tells you, gives you a whole space, but how do you select out of the whole space? I mean, for example, stability here tells you in this particular case, if your S22 is less than one, it tells you that all of this space, the green space is available, but which one is going to be, you cannot have this infinite many points, all right? You need to have guidance on which points to use. And so you need additional information to be able to select how you are going to, um, where you are going to put your gamma out in this particular case. Okay, so um, I will do some examples on how to place CL and RL or CS and RS. And then we're, next time we're going to move forward to um, gain circles. And... Um, I will update this information, put it up, will clean it up with some of the changes that I made here, as you can see, because I had a, I, I did not pay attention to change those when I copied it. All right. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Did you I'll be available for office hours. Did you remove a course 10? What's that? Did you remove a course 10? What is equal 10? Quiz, quiz 10, the, the previous quiz. Um, yes, the, the quiz, I, uh, you're gonna see it from last week. I mean, most of you responded well. I will, I will spend some time to, to, to talk about it on Wednesday, but almost um, nine, uh, well, a very large percentage of the class uh, identified. I didn't answer that because you said it's gonna still open until Wednesday. Ah, okay, because I thought, okay. You can, uh, for those of you who did, who did not do that, go ahead and do, I will open it up again, but do it today though. Can okay. you do it today? Yes, I will do it today. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, All I'm right. in the same boat there too. Okay, <laughs> yes, I'll open it up and do it until midnight today. How about this? Sounds yeah, good. That's good. Okay. Perfect, thank, thank you. you. All right, you're welcome.